I'm going to start with uh, some thank yous. I want to thank you for everybody that uh, attended and helped us two weeks ago, two Saturdays, two, two Sundays ago, when we did the, um, the Jubilee. That was absolutely fantastic. And the response from the estate there was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. They couldn't believe what we were doing on that estate, and they couldn't believe they didn't have to pay for anything. So that's, uh, that was really, really good. We had a great time there. Um, we've got a recording of it now, and we'll be uploading that today sometime. Uh, so you can have a look at, on that one. I want to thank you for those who turned up yesterday, helped, and uh, just attended yesterday. It was a strange day yesterday. When the wind wasn't blowing, it was boiling hot and lovely. But when the wind was blowing, it was a bit chilly. But we had a really great time. We started at nine, we finished about half past six, something like that. But um, it was really good. So thank you for that. And it was great that I met quite a few people, four or five people that used to come to us. And when you sit down and have a coffee with them and say, well, where have you been then? And they said, well, we should come back, shouldn't we? Now it's the next stage after that is the important one. Will they come back? But we've done our bit, which is, which is really good. So thank you for that. When we had our last church meeting, we discussed um, Sunday school and the needs of Sunday schools. And lots of you gave me your names to say you want to be involved. Well, next Sunday after the service, just for 15, 20 minutes, just want to speak to everybody so we can tie that one down. And so if you want to be involved, we can get those things underway, which is great. Another one, the QCM is on the 26th of the 6th. What we're going to do is start at 10 o'clock in the morning, have our service, so we'll obviously be finishing earlier, and then we'll have the QCM. Um, the agendas should be going out this week, and if you've got any questions, then send them in to us. We need the questions by the 22nd, 23rd of June, so we can have a little read of them beforehand and decide if we're not going to come so we don't have to answer that one. Um, but no, if you can give us your questions, that would be really, really good. The other thing is something that we've done before, but we want to sort of uh, start again, is that in our services, we want to be able to pray for people. If you remember, in the school and in church, what we used to do, we have an area whereby we would pray for people. So from next Sunday, we're going to use this area back here. So if there's any needs amongst us, anybody needing prayer, then you come out and we'll have a team to pray with you. What I'm looking for is that team. So I need some of you to turn around and say, and let me start by saying it's not going to be every week uh, because there may not be need for everybody every week. But we need to be praying for people, don't we? Yeah. We need to be sharing what God yeah. is giving to us. And we need to be part of people's lives in that way. So if you can let me know today, and we'll start that from next Sunday. Yeah. Okay? But don't forget, it isn't every week. So it's not, well, I can't speak to anybody because I've got to go over here. We will keep it going and make it so that it uh, works for every one of us. So that's great. Let's just pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the beauty of this day and the beauty of all that you've created. As we were uh, sitting outside praying this morning, a seagull decided to praise you. And it was the loudest seagull, seagull I've heard for a long time. Um, and it really, really was making a noise. And I just thought, well, this creation, speaking back to its creator. And the, that's our joy this morning, Father, that we come, that we can speak to you as our creator and give you all the praise and all the glory. Because you, you and only you deserve it. And we're going to give that to you this morning. We're going to go straight into prayer for the nations. That's Louise. Where's this side? Underground, and on Wednesday night I couldn't sleep because I was worried about it. I, my right legs a bit, um, and I decided I'd look up the train fares if I could book another train. Anyway, I booked a, a train fare from Victoria to Worthing for twelve pounds fifty. Exactly. 
Uh, so yeah, I really want to praise God. And on the way up, you know, when there was stairs, somebody offered to carry my case. God was with me all the way. Glad he sends her love. She misses this church an awful lot. She loved the way it fit. She thought that was fantastic. Right. Um, as those of you who know me know that my heart has always been with Israel. So this morning we're going to play. We're going to pray for the for the ministries in Israel that are run by Jewish people, Jewish Christians, uh, Israeli Christians. Uh, I'll name a few. I know some of you also pray for Israel, so you probably know a few others that I don't. But Shalanu TV, One for Israel, Vision for Israel, Christian Embassy, Tikkun International, Friends of Israel, King of Kings Ministries, and Malachs. Heavenly Father, we lift those and others, Lord, known to some of us and to known to you, Lord, who are, who are spreading the gospel, who are telling Jewish people that you, Lord Jesus, Yeshua, are their Messiah. Lord, we pray that people will, that you will put in people's heart the desire to actually read your word. We pray for the, the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox, Lord, that you will put a desire, especially in the young men, to read your word, not just the readings, not just the writings of, of rabbis, Lord, but to read, to actually read your word, the Torah, and Lord, find you. Lord, we pray for all that is on YouTube. Lord, that they know that people watch these testimonies and listen to these sermons secretly, Lord. Lord, just declare yourself. To your people, Father. Lord, we love you. We love your land. And Lord, we can't wait for what Paul said in Romans, that when Israel believes, it will be for us life from the dead. So Heavenly Father, would you please bless your nation. Protect them by the power of the name of Jesus, by the power of the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. So Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. Amen. Amen. Before we go into time of worship, I just want to read um, from Philippians, one of Paul's uh, teachings, and it's Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 11 verses there. And if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joys complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one spirit and of one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of of you should look not on your own interests, but also on the interests of others. And your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the, on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that is what worship is about this morning. Coming under that name, the name which is above every name. And we come and we worship him. Thank you.
sharing classes. And there's just something I want to share with you that I feel the Lord's just said and been leading me into this week. Oh, look at them. Aren't they fabulous? Look at them going out. Lord, we pray for our children. We love them so much. They are the next generation who will take the gospel. Lord, we pray for each one of them that they might find a personal relationship with Jesus that fills their heart. It was quite an unusual song to start with. Um, we usually try and do something to warm your voices up. And, but I just felt God wanted to start that because I felt challenged by the words. There's one line in there that says, And show me who you are and fill me with your heart. And I just wonder as you've come into church this morning, who is God to you? Who is God to you this morning? Maybe you don't know him personally. Maybe you haven't accepted Jesus. So, so maybe you still have that old-fashioned idea of the, the very stern father sitting on the, on the throne wagging a finger. You know, you've broken my rules. He can be stern. But you know, there's a, there's a wonderful challenge that God is so many things. And at different times in our lives, we need our Heavenly Father, and we need our beautiful Jesus, and we need the presence of the Holy Spirit to be to us what we need. And that's good, and that's fine. But you know, there's a very favourite song that I just feel is for some of us this morning, and it's 23. Come on, you know the words, the... And if you don't, that's one of the psalms that you probably will see on tea towels and all sorts. The Lord is my shepherd. But the next words, I shall not want. And I felt God just challenged me to uh, just not make him weak this morning. I don't, there's no way I want to make God weak. But for some of you, you need a shepherd. You need God to be your shepherd at the moment. Maybe you're full of blessing and you're loving being part of the flock. And you just love to be blessed by God. Hallelujah, it's wonderful. I love it that you're in that place. But maybe you feel a bit more like the lost sheep. Maybe you feel, I wrote some things down. Disappointment. Are you disappointed this morning? Has life or this week or today or your family or whatever not quite worked out the way you wanted and you're struggling with disappointment? You may not even know you are, but I assure you that there's times do you feel a failure this morning? I wonder if that little sheep that got lost felt, oh, I failed. I've not stayed with the flock. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Are you fearful this morning about what the future holds for you? Either emotionally, physically, or whatever. But then on the positive side, are you trusting God at the moment? Are you just digging deep and trusting him and knowing that your shepherd's gonna look after you and care for you? Are you full of thankfulness this morning for what he's done for you? Do you feel that you need to stand firm on something this morning? God wants you to know that he's your shepherd. He's going to woo you. Isn't that a lovely thought? You read some of those lovely love poems in scripture and God at certain times comes and woos us. He doesn't come as a stern father, he comes as a loving God. And I want to challenge you this morning. I, I was really excited because this is what I, I was asking the elders if I was, they were happy for me to do this this morning. And, and then Paul shared what he shared about people being prayed for in the corner. Because I just feel that I want to challenge you this morning to make a physical move forward. To come forward. To, to just say to God, I love you, you're my shepherd. Now, I'm not saying to you, come forward if you're broken. Come forward if you're broken, that's fine. But I'm saying if you want to be blessed by God, if you want to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit this morning, if you want to just come forward and stand and just say, I'm standing here just because I've made the steps forward and I'm standing firm right where you want me to be, come forward as a declaration this morning that you want to stand where God is saying you. So, do you hear what I'm saying? I'm saying you can come forward to just be in this space. Just come and stand with us as a worship team. And we're going to sing the Lord's My Shepherd after a while. Some of you may want someone to pray with you. Some may just want to stand, you know? And having done all to stand, it says in Scripture. And I love that for some of you, maybe you're just standing firm. 
So what I'm just going to do is invite you, and it's going to be the first two people to start moving, who are the heroes of this morning, to just come forward and stand in the spaces here, just as a way of saying to God, thank you for blessing me, thank you for being my shepherd, or Lord, I need you, oh, I need you this morning. Is that okay? So who's going to be brave? Come and stand with us.
Should we take our seats? But don't just say one thing. There are too many people in Christian circles that come in with problems and go back out with problems. That is not of God. What God wants is for you to come in and bring your problems. Put them at the altar and he will meet your needs. I would hate to think that anybody comes this morning and goes back out still in need. God is the God that does the impossible, isn't he? Amen. And if he is the God, the God that does the impossible, why would he not do the impossible in your life? Why would he not come and touch you where you are? And you know, you, you may have come out this morning and I hope you haven't gone back to thinking, oh, I wish they'd come and prayed for me. But if that's the case, at the end of the service, if you want prayer, they come onto my left hand side here and we will pray. And we'll continue to pray. And you know, we're on uh, prayer every, every Monday, every Wednesday, every Friday. And I'll tell you what, you might not know how much we pray for you, but we do. And the, the secret of it all is what God does out of what we pray. And God's doing great things and will continue to do great things. So don't feel left out, left out this morning. And even if you didn't come out, but you now want prayer, then you come out at the end of the service and we'll pray with you. Thank you.
church on the moon that would have pleased the Apostle Paul. I'm going to speak about him this morning because with the prophet Jeremiah of the Old Testament, Paul is my favorite man. <laughs> I guess it all started in the book of Acts, and it is Luke, Dr. Luke, the beloved physician, as Paul calls him, the gospel writer from Antioch who wrote it. He was a companion of Paul's, often traveling with him, especially at sea and had a keen interest in researching the events surrounding the life of Jesus and the growth of the church. Through him, we come to understand that the most prominent person in Acts is in fact the Holy Spirit. It is addressed to the most excellent Theophilus, most probably a lawyer or a judge, and Luke was doubtless aware that his brief or written defense might be more widely circulated as people in Rome did ask questions about the faith for which Paul stood trial. Luke wanted to provide full details about Peter and Paul to give enough information for Theophilus to understand how the Christian faith had developed and why the Apostle Paul was now unjustly accused. So Paul the Apostle and the missionary. The Apostle Paul had a considerable influence over the spreading of the Gospel and subsequently the history of Europe. As the early church grew all around the Mediterranean, from Jerusalem to Rome, oh, my map please, we discover how great were his influence through his missionary work and his input through the letters he wrote to the churches. And if he was a man of destiny, he is mostly a man with a legacy. There you are. That's the main churches of the, of the uh, early church. The rapidity through which the good news spread in Asia Minor and all around the Mediterranean will never cease to amaze us and make us glad because of the zeal of this dear man together with the men and women who assisted him. So who was Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul? We certainly know about him much more than we do of the other apostles. Born in Tarsus, which is in southeast Turkey, his parentage was Jewish. His father had a business of tent making, mainly to the Roman army, and this may have been the reason why he was made a Roman citizen in recognition of his good services. This honor would have passed on to his son Saul and given him civic rights, that's very important, which he claimed on several occasions while traveling throughout the empire, and especially at the end of his life when he appealed to Caesar to be beheaded rather than crucified. He also spoke Greek, therefore with Jewish, Roman and Greek influence, he had the perfect package to be a missionary. His parents gave him the name Saul, or Saul as we say, maybe in honor of Saul the king, as they were also the crime of Benjamin. At the age of 12, when he became a man according to the Jewish law, he joined the family business in tent making, and this did set him up very well during all his travels because he used his trade, always working very hard to earn a living and always encouraging the believers to do so. Tarsus was a university town, just like Athens and Alexandria at the time, yet his parents chose to send him to Jerusalem to learn from the famous Jewish teacher Gamaliel. Very quickly, as the new religions grew, he became convinced that the new believers were a threat to the Jewish religious establishment. It was progressing from Jerusalem and very quickly gaining a ground, so Saul became a zealous defender of the Jewish religion, eager to destroy the followers of the new. 
He addressed letters to the synagogue in Damascus asking for their cooperation in arresting all the followers so that they may be brought back in chain to Jerusalem. Why did he look like? Well, we know that he was short, balding, that his eyes were peculiar, and his hands were very rough. He was a tent maker. Important that to know that we had a, a, a manual work to do. In his letters, he speaks of a physical ailment from which he had asked the Lord to deliver him, but to no avail. Very likely, he suffered from the failing eyesight, and he's writing in big letters, as he duly says so himself. The first time we set eyes on him is at the condemnation and martyrdom of the deacon Stevens, against whom he had a casting vote. While they were stoning Stephen, he looked after the coats. Yet it is the way in which Stephen died that started to trouble him very deeply. It never left him, in fact. His radiant face looking to heaven and seeing the radiant Lord Jesus caused Saul to have his conscience to become very uneasy. So it is that on the way to Damascus, the Lord Jesus met him in a dramatic way, revealing his splendor, his splendor, because he was back to heaven then. He asked the question, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Rising from the ground, Saul realized that he was blind. Led him to the town, he remained blind for three days and went without food and water. In Damascus, he the believer called Ananias, to whom the Lord spoke in a vision, telling him to go to straight street and ask for the one soul of Tarsus. Well, the dear woman must have been filled with terror at hearing the command, Saul, Saul, who persecutes the believers? Go and do what I say was the command. For Saul is my chosen instrument to go and take the message to the Gentiles. Upon finding Saul, Ananias laid hand on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus will appear to you on the road, ascend me so that you may recover your sight. Be baptized with water and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then Saul got up and was baptized, and after a few days, he began preaching that Christ was the Son of God and never stopped preaching the message until his death put a stop to it in Rome. Well, immediately raising controversy, I have to say, with the Jewish people. Now, going about God's business required transformation. Paul went away for 13 years, three years in Arabia, and then back in, in his own town of Tarsus. To rethink his theology was very important which was now suddenly being put into question. Spending time in prayer, learning to understand the Lord, becoming acquainted with the voice of the Holy Spirit, and eventually in the Lord's strength, starting his ministry. It is that dear man, Barnabas, who took the risk of defending Paul and brought him to the church in, the region, in Jerusalem, and from then to Antioch, where the first Gentile church started and his calling was confirmed. And from there, the three missionary journey started with the East family, very shabby, planting churches in the northeastern part of the Mediterranean, Turkey and Asia Minor, Cyprus, Crete, all around Greece, the islands, with his eye on Rome and Spain, and so on until his third and last journey, which left when he left Crete such shipwrecked in Malta and arrived in Rome as a prisoner. And when he went Paul got into trouble, he was flogged, despised, attacked, went hungry, thrown into prison several times, encountered many sleepless nights and financial difficulties, was set upon and left for dead, ran incredible dangers, but was always moving on, always moving. Many accusations were made against him. A coward, a fanatic, a trickster, a flatterer, a dictator, but he marched on for his Lord. And his integrity could never be questioned. He faced opposition wherever he went. 
human opposition largely from Jews to, to jealousy and a satanic opposition, of course. His defense was not primarily for him, but always for the authenticity, authenticity of the gospel and for Christ. Once a small cluster of believers or a small church had been established, Paul was on the move. His strategy was trusting and delegating the life of the church to the elders and those strong in the faith. New territory, fresh ground were waiting for him and all for the sake of the kingdom of God. He was full of passion, with a greater zeal for his saviour, of immense courage, but with controlled anger in the most difficult of circumstances. A man of tears and compassion, who lived for Christ alone and eager to die for the truth. He went on focusing totally on one thing that had been called to and was forever grateful to the Lord for choosing him. Paul lived for the gospel. But he never forgot the churches he planted, and his biggest burden was the responsibility of caring for them. His follow-up work ensured that the churches grew in quality and quantity. Therefore, he could either revisit them or write to them. In those days, there was indeed an official postal service, but it was mostly reserved for the civil servants of the empire. So you could not just pop around the corner and post your letter. <laughs> letter to the gate. <laughs> you actually had to wait until someone went where you wanted to send it and trusted the letter into their care. And we know who were the carriers. For example, during the winter that Paul spent in Corris with Priscilla and Aquila, he wrote the letter to the church in Rome. And in Sancria lived the lady deacon called Phoebe, who had an import export business and was used to navigate the Mediterranean. Paul and trusted her to take the letter and ask the believers in Rome, when he hadn't yet been, to welcome our very dear sister Phoebe, who comes in my name. Tachicus, who was with Paul in Rome, took back with him the letter to the Ephesians, which did the round to the churches in Hierapolis and Laodicea, and the letter to the church in Colossae, very likely traveling back with the slave Onesimus, who had been Paul's manservant and was himself taking his letter to his master Philemon, from whom he had run away. Epaphroditus, who came from the church in Philippi, we heard the reading of the church to the Philippians before, with some money from the believers to help Paul with his mundane needs in his house, arrest in Rome, and who sadly very quickly became ill and nearly on to death, was sent back to recover with a letter of thanks, the letter of thanks, a letter to the Philippians. And Timothy and Titus, the trusted companions, to the letter to the church in Corinth and Thessalonica. But why letters? Towards the end of his ministry, letter writing became his only means of communication, for he spent a lot of time in prison. Two years in Caesarea, awaiting trial, and two years in house arrest in Rome, chained to a Roman soldier, changed every seven hours. There were personal letters to Titus, Philemon, and Timothy. Occasional, because they responded to an occasion, a situation, or a crisis. And general, like the letter to the Ephesians. And for the full benefit, the letters should always be read in their entirety. They should be considered around the history, the geography, the culture, and the morality of those to whom they are addressed. So what had happened that one warranted a written reply? The world had crept into the church and a different gospel was being preached in favor of religious traditions and obligation, pagan festivals and rituals. Disunity and arguments among believers were threatening the very order 
of the fellowship, led by false teaching, which encouraged sinful lifestyle, and were questioning, even denying, false teaching and Christ's resurrection. Therefore, the letter brought greetings, even compliments, concerns, instructions for personal conduct and behavior, marriage and celibate issues, the role of women, practical thinking about what they were free to eat and drink, the importance of harmony in the home and in the church, encouraging purity, unity, charity, humility, and integrity, the importance of maturing in the faith with the responsibility which went with it. They reflected joy, praise, and consolation, sometimes very strong condemnation, but always with correction, direction, and encouragement for believing themselves, but also for church leaders, and always under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who is a spirit of love, power, and self-control, and who helps in the exercise of the spiritual gifts. He upheld that salvation comes by grace, and not by deeds or work of the law, and that both baptism by water and the Spirit are needed for a proper initiation into the kingdom. Yet with a very strong warning against those who come in and start preaching a different gospel or make demands based on the Jewish law. The false prophet who had come in at the detriment of the fellowship, who were wrecking the character of the churches and created barriers for the gospel, and who did not hesitate to condemn Paul and encourage people to lead a different lifestyle. If he could, Paul would write, dictated in fact, the letters were dictated, nice things to the people before he came down to the big business. He who considered himself a slave of Christ understood exactly what grace was about. Where we were Christ's enemy, he died for us all. He insisted upon the gospel about the future, not only about now, but about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. A gospel which transformed people's lifestyle. A gospel which promotes gratitude and internal recognition of what Christ has done for us. A gospel where Jesus is seen as judge and saviour, the only wise God, the living God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Throughout the letters and to the people whom the Lord brought alongside him, he was always immensely grateful for their utmost loyalty and in particular to the women who helped him financially and worked very hard for the gospel. The Greek word there is actually how you stretch a muscle, stretch a muscle. So he was actually using that Greek word to see how hard the people, and the women in particular, had worked for the gospel. Prisca and Aquila, or Priscilla, his very dear friends who we met in Corinth, they came from Rome, went with him to Ephesus, and have held, held with the disciple of the churches there. Timothy, young Timothy, recipient of two letters, became a believer quite young, and Paul considered him as his dear own son. Remember, he had no family. He worked with him in the churches in Ephesus, Corinth, Thessalonica, and Philippi. Silas was with Paul as part of the second missionary journey when Paul and Barnabas parted ways. He was chosen to go with him. Like minded, they traveled together, establishing and ministering to the churches. Titus, recipient of one letter and in whom Paul had total confidence, was very active in the growth and spread of the gospel 
and achieved great result in Corinth and Crete. Apollos, the evangelist who discovered the Holy Spirit through Priscilla, the one who watered the seed that Paul had planted and made it grow in Corinth and Ephesus. Tychicus, who is called a beloved brother, a faithful minister, was a great encourager to Paul during his imprisonment. He worked as an interim pastor to Titus and Timothy. And dear old faithful Barnabas, a wonderful and humble companion who was there right from the beginning in Jerusalem and recognized that Paul had been set aside by God for taking the gospel to the Gentiles. I like to imagine Paul during his time in Corinth. He was there for about 18 months and he went to be with um, Priscilla and Aquila who were also tent makers. The Lord has always a way to bring people together. And as they were making the tent together for the Easter's Games, a bit like the Olympic Games, watching and observing the athlete trade for the competitions, Paul says, remember that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. You also must run in such a way that you will win. All athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for the eternal prize. So I ran straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I am not a boxer who misses the punching. I discipline my body like an athlete's training to do so. Otherwise, I feel that preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. What a man. What a faithful worker for the gospel and for Christ whom he always put first. The Apostle Paul, Saint Paul, the champion of the Christian faith, the top missionary of all times. His legacy through his letters has brought the kingdom of God down the ages to the rich of all those who put their trust in Christ. And I want to read the passage of the letter to Philemon. It's a very, very small letter, very often forgotten. It's a gem of a letter because actually it's about the gospel. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, always started with Paul, so he knew exactly who wrote the letter. And Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Achaia, our sister, there again, thanking the women. And Archippus, a fellow soldier, and the church in your house, because obviously you know that the church is met in people's houses. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your face may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through. We gain a lot by getting to know the Apostle Paul. He's a wonderful champion, a wonderful man. Shall we pray? Mm. Lord, we thank you for the legacy of Paul's letters. We thank you that he always put you first, Lord Jesus.
that he was an eager worker beyond measure for the gospel. But through him and his helpers, the gospel could be propagated, starting from Asia and all the way to Rome. We thank you that it was the work of the Holy Spirit who used men and women to do just that. We thank you that we can say to one another, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us, each one of us, for the sake of Christ and the gospel. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us today and always, with your spirit and with the Holy Spirit. For the glory of God the Father, for the extension of the kingdom of God where we are, and indeed for the kingdom to come. Come, Lord Jesus. Your kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, here in our life, in that little portion of the world that is worthy. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. this beautiful name and the beautiful Jesus that we've been worshipping this morning.
thank you this morning, Father, that we are linked to you in relationship. You are ours and we are you, yours. And we give you thanks this morning. We think of all that you've done for us. Lord, we can't stop saying thank you because of the greatness that you've done in each of our lives. And as we leave this, home, this place, Lord, we just ask that you would rest the bite with us, that you would continue to bless us, and continue to pour out your spirit upon us. Lord, that we would be recipients and giving out the message of, the, of your gospel as other people might come to know that which we know this morning. So be with us, Father, we pray. For your name's sake. Amen. Amen. As I said earlier on, if you want prayer, please come to my left and we'll have people who will come and pray in order that you may be blessed this morning.